Greetings. I'm Reverend Susan Francis, pronouns she, her. I'm a white woman with short brown hair that is turning a great gray color. And today I'm wearing a blue shirt with a design on the front. I am joining you from Chicago on the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. I currently serve the Unitarian Church of Evanston and I'm working with our UU The Vote team. In my previous vocation, I was an attorney. I did not practice any law involving nonprofit organizations. So when questions arose this spring from my UU The Vote team around the election process and the IRS nonprofit 501c3 regulations, I decided I needed to learn about them. I hope sharing some of what I have learned will be helpful for you and your congregation. And most importantly, I hope that I share what I share with you today will alleviate any anxiety you have about being in compliance with the IRS 501c3 regulations. I know participants are joining us today from UU fellowships, societies, congregations, and churches. For ease of this presentation, I'm going to use the word congregation to describe all these ways of organizing in our UU communities. So let's get started with the slides. As many of you know, being a 501c3 organization means being a nonprofit organization that has been approved by the IRS as a tax exempt charitable organization. Charitable is broadly defined as being established for purposes that are religious, educational, scientific, and many more. The UUA holds 501c3 status. However, UU congregations do not have 501c3 status simply by being associated with the UUA. While congregations do not have to go through the same application process with the IRS as educational, scientific, and other organizations, Congregations do need to file with the IRS to have 501c3 status assigned, and they're then required to abide by the 501c3 regulations. So the slide that we have up right now is an easy way to remember the general guidelines of 501c3 compliance. Issues and values, totally fine. Candidates, political parties, don't do it. I'm going to take you through advocacy, elections, candidates, political parties, and lobbying. And then I'll leave you with some additional resources. Next slide, please. There are many ways that we can advocate for our UU values, including engaging in issue advocacy and organizing for justice. Even if an issue has become politicized within our society, we can still take a stance on that issue. I want to give you a very simplistic differentiation between political and partisan. Political is being engaged in civic life. We can be political and adhere to the 501c3 rules. Partisan, is about taking a side, picking a party or a candidate. We cannot be partisan. Once you have partisan activities within your congregation, you are violating the 501c3 rules. Here are some of the many ways we can be engaged in our society's political process as a 501c3. We can use our brick and mortar spaces to be a host to events and activities. Make sure your congregation has a consistent policy regarding to whom you rent and to whom you donate space. If you allow members to have free space for events and they want to use it for non-partisan issue events or candidate forums, that's fine. These non-partisan events can also be advertised through congregational channels. UU The Vote has sample facility use agreements online, and I'll share the link to their site at the end of my presentation. 
our congregations can partner with other organizations. We can partner with other 501c3 organizations with no issue. We can also partner with 501c4 organizations as long as the event is a nonpartisan event. 501c4 organizations are social welfare organizations and can do everything that a 501c3 organization can do, plus they can engage in unlimited lobbying. They can endorse and oppose candidates and they can engage in political campaigns as long as that is not the organization's primary activity. So the main question when deciding to partner with a 501c4 is to determine if the activity or event is about issues or if it is about a candidate or political party. If it is an issue focused event, it is fine to partner with a 501c34 organization and that can be a powerful alliance. You as the 501c3 will have the responsibility to make sure the 501c4 knows that you must stay focused on the nonpartisan issue and activities. For example, if it is about general voter registration, you are good to partner with the 501c4. If it is about promoting voter registration with the goal of getting people who may vote for a certain political party registered, then don't do it, including don't put an advertisement in your newsletter or send out emails through other congregational channels or have a pulpit announcement. In addition to not being able to engage with partisan activity, your congregation cannot have as its sole purpose political advocacy. And for our faith communities who engage in worship and faith formation, this should not be a problem. Also remember that congregants communicating with, with each other directly and outside of the congregation's channels are not governed by the IRS regulations. Lay and professional leaders of a congregation are able to make personal endorsements of candidates or political parties. For example, I can say that I'm Reverend Susan Francis and I work at UCE and that I'm personally endorsing so-and-so for governor. I cannot say this at the congregation or through any congregational channels, but I could say it to the local newspaper or let the candidates say that I have endorsed them. If I am a congregant, I can say, I'm Susan Francis. I teach at District 77. I'm active with my UU congregation and I'm voting for a certain candidate. Again, I cannot have this conversation in the congregation's building or on the grounds. So these types of partisan conversations during coffee hour or in the parking lot should be avoided. Another example is if a congregant posts something on one of the congregation's social media platforms about personally endorsing a candidate or political party, this one-off post will likely not affect your congregation's 501c3 status. However, it would be best if your congregation has a clear communications policy about not making such posts and for whoever monitors your social media to post a reminder about that policy. If the conversation chain grows, you may need to take it down. So let's move to our next slide. Our Congregations are also able to engage in a wide variety of activities in our election process, from providing nonpartisan voter education and information, to conducting voter registration and get out the vote drives, to combating voter suppression. We are not to be intervening in campaigns in a way that would influence the outcome of an election. This includes that we cannot do any type of scorecard or ranking of the candidates' positions with regard to how they line up with our values. Next slide. We are able to engage with candidates to educate them on issues or to invite them to attend a candidate forum. 
Candidate forums must include an invitation to all candidates running for a position and the questioning cannot be biased. We can also engage officials who are currently serving while running for office. You will need to make sure that you are engaging with them about what was done or is being done. If you are talking about their future plans or talk about a current or future election, then that could be a problem. Also, if the congregation is a sponsor or co-sponsor of an issue-oriented event where a candidate will be speaking, you are responsible for making sure the candidate knows to speak only to the issues and not about their campaign. Whoever you are inviting to the event, whether it is a candidate or not, you are responsible for being clear that the congregation has boundaries around our 501c3 status. Having said that, if a speaker goes off script, it will likely be okay if it is a one-off happening. However, if it does happen, you must make sure to not disseminate what was said, such as by posting the recording on your YouTube channel or quoting them in your newsletter. We have to be careful that our congregation's involvement with any candidate does not lead to the perception that the congregation has endorsed or opposed any candidate running for elected office. Next slide, please. We are not able to partner with a political party, even for a nonpartisan issue event. The only exception to engaging with a partisan group, such as a political party, is that they may rent space in your building if they comply with your rental policy. As I mentioned earlier, it is important to have a clear policy of who can rent and who has access to free space. If you let members use space without paying rent, there needs to be an exception that this cannot include organizations that are partisan. Consistency in adhering to your rental policy is the key to maintaining compliance with the 501c3 regulations. Having said that, your congregation is absolutely allowed to say no to renting to an organization whose values conflict with the congregations. If you choose to rent to a partisan group, you cannot advertise their events through your congregational channels like the newsletter or social media. Essentially, we cannot do anything that would be perceived as endorsing or opposing a political party. Next slide, please. A 501c3 does have a limited ability to engage in lobbying. The IRS has not provided a strict rule for when a 501c3 has exceeded its lobbying quotient. However, courts and the IRS have ruled in the past that lobbying activity constituting 5% or less of a congregation's total activities is acceptable. Total activities includes the total amount of money, staff, and volunteer time that goes into running the organization. While the 5% amount is not a strict rule, it can be used as a guidepost for an organization's lobbying activities. Lobbying activities include endorsing or imposing ballot initiatives or referendums and taking a stand on nonpartisan appointments, such as a court nominee. As I mentioned before, even if an elected official is currently running for office, you are always able to lobby them about current issues. Next slide, please. Interpretation of the IRS 501c3 regulations are subjective. Having a clear reason for why you decided to act in the way you did is important. So if you are unsure how to proceed, talk with others about it. Cases where congregations have lost their 501c3 status have been based on egregious facts. So understanding the general rule of issues and values are fine, and candidates and political parties are off limits should keep you from making such egregious errors. This information is given to empower you to make informed decisions to do the work of living our values out in the world. Be respectful of the general guideline and be thoughtful in your decision-making and then move forward with the many ways 
you can be involved in the election process. Next slide, please. What I want to leave you with is reassurance that you don't need to obsess about what you can't do. There is so much you can do to engage with our democratic election process. And I encourage you to spend your energy getting organized around those options. If you want to learn a little more about the IRS 501c3 regulations, here are some additional resources. The UUA's UU the Vote office, they are there to help. If you have any questions about what electoral work is allowed or want help figuring out a local partner to work with, contact them. For example, the two partner organizations my congregation worked with in 2020 have changed their messaging and focus to be partisan. So we've spent, back a few months ago, we spent time um, to figure out who our new partner organizations for the 2022 election cycle would be. UU The Vote is offering to help you with things like this. Their weekly office hours are every other Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Time. And this started May 17th. So, um, so every other Tuesday from May 17th onward. The webinar, Prophetic, Not Partisan, Understanding IRS Nonprofit Regulations from the 2020 UU The Vote campaign covers everything I covered today in much more detail. In addition to the do's and don'ts of the 501c3 rules, it also provides the history of the 501 section in the IRS code. The real rules, congregations, and the IRS guidelines on advocacy, lobbying, and election gives clear and understandable examples from what can go in a newsletter to when a candidate could attend a gathering at the congregation. And finally, the UU The Vote 2020 official launch guide has details about a congregation's rental space, including a sample facility use agreement. This guide is referenced in the UU The Vote's current 2022 launch guide. Last slide. This was a lot of information in a short period of time. If you have questions, I do encourage you to contact the UUA's UU The Vote office during their Tuesday evening office hours and best wishes on your engagement with the 2022 election cycle.